So, King, could you please start your presentation now? Sure. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Tim Bird, and uh, I am uh, an employee at Sony, uh, but I also am the architecture group chair for uh, the CE work group or the core embedded Linux project at Linux Foundation. Today I'd like to talk about Fuego, give a little bit of an introduction, and talk about the status and future directions for this, for this tool. So, let me see here. Hmm. My keyboard's not responding. All right, just a sec. There we go. Um, so this presentation is actually two presentations in one. Uh, the first part of it will be an introduction to Fuego. Uh, I've given this before at other uh, conferences, but it's useful to uh, for people who are just starting to uh, learn about Fuego. Uh, and then the second half of this presentation will really be about the status and the future directions. And uh, Hopefully this will be interesting material, even if you're not interested in Fuego, if you're using one of the other test frameworks that's out there, uh, and I have some ideas about uh, how we can make progress uh, as an industry, uh, and then I have some specific things about uh, Fuego that have been going on recently. So, the first presentation, Introduction to the Fuego Test System. Um, so this is the major outline. I'm going to go uh, through a quick introduction, then go through some some of the architecture of Fuego, and then talk about uh, customization and then vision. So Fuego, if you uh, boil it down, Fuego really consists of about three things. It's Jenkins, plus some abstraction scripts, uh, plus a bunch of prepackaged tests, and all of that inside a Docker container. Um, and so let me go through each of those major components uh, in a little bit more detail. So Jenkins, uh, I think a lot of people are familiar with Jenkins. It's a continuous integration system. It's used for launching test jobs uh, based on various triggers. Uh, it's quite flexible. Uh, basically, can launch jobs and then show the test results. Um, and it has a whole ecosystem of plugins. There are literally hundreds of plugins for Jenkins to do uh, all kinds of different things, integration with different source code management systems. So if you're tracking a Git repository, it knows how to respond to uh, commits um, and use those as a trigger for um, for launching a test. It has email notifications. There are different interface views you can plug in and change the interface of Jenkins pretty easily to see uh, different types of data and includes plotting of results. It's uh, kind of too big of a system to describe in detail, it's uh, and there's documentation online about Jenkins. Uh, a lot of people are actually already using Jenkins. So let me move on to the, uh, in, in Fuego, what we do with Jenkins is uh, we customize it in particular ways specifically for testing embedded Linux. So uh, in particular, we've added support for host target configurations, so the Jenkins jobs Actually, the Jenkins slaves are mapped directly onto target boards, which are assumed to be remote. And then we uh, we pre-install a set of interfaces. Uh, so we pre-install a bunch of plugins to add interfaces uh, that we think are useful for this type of testing. And uh, I think there's about 30 or 40 of them that we assemble and install for you. Uh, this is what the main interface looks like for, for Fuego. Uh, and uh, I'll go in kind of more detail, but this is the main dashboard view. And then uh, you can, there are different tests that are available across uh, tabs in this view. Uh, the, the first tab, which is history, shows you the last several tests that have run and what their status is. And then over on the left-hand side, you can see the different targets that are available and the status of each of those. Uh, whether they're idle, what what tests they're currently executing, uh, that type of thing. Um, so the next part of Fuego is a set of abstraction scripts. So uh, what we want to do is we have we allow the user to define just a few variables and shell scripts uh, that allow the system to interact with target bo boards, and then Fuego pro provides a whole bunch of shell functions uh, for command and control of the target. Uh, most of these are SSH based. Uh, at the, at the moment, but we can get and put files 
on the target. We can execute commands. Uh, we have routines for collecting logs. Um, we're doing test setup and that type of thing. So Fuego actually generates a full test script at runtime based on a whole bunch of information that it gets, based on board configuration, uh, the tool chain variables that you're using, and a bunch of test variables. And so uh, this allows a lot of aspects of the test to be abstracted. Uh, and this is actually uh, very important. That's kind of a bigger deal than it sounds like, but uh, I'll get back to this uh, concept in a bit. The other main component of uh, Fuego is that it actually comes with over te 50 tests already integrated and prepackaged. Uh, and the tests cover a variety of uh, test uh, areas, uh, things like file system tests and uh, LMBench, basic kind of core CPU tests. There are networking tests, stress tests, performance tests. Uh, the L Linux uh, LTP, which is Linux Test Project, uh, so a very comprehensive uh, test suite is also available. Uh, and so those are all ready to go. Uh, users should be able to run those on a board. Uh, and the tests really kind of come out in three categories, functional, benchmark, and stress tests. And so you can uh, use, use this test framework, hopefully, to find uh, problems uh, that might uh, come up as you're working on the software for a board. Uh, one thing about the tests is we actually ship the test source code, the test program source code. And the, an actual test consists of multiple pieces, but one of, one of those is uh, source code. Um, and the reason we do that is the, the framework is intended to be generic and be able to be used with a board of any architecture. Um, and so we actually do build the test from source uh, you can, we, we do pre-install a generic ARM tool chain, and if you happen to be running on um, a, a host machine that has an x86 tool chain, you can uh, use that as well. But in most cases, what you're going to want to do is install your own tool chain or SDK uh, into uh, this so that the binaries that are built, the test binaries that we create with Fuego, will run on your target board. So the, the SDK that you have um, will have the libraries and the headers needed to build tests. There's, we actually provide, there is a repository that has an open embedded meta layer available uh, so that you can build your own SDK that will have all of the materials needed to build the tests that are packaged in our core repository. Um, but uh, the SDK in general should work for most most tests that you, uh, new tests that you create. So the last part of uh, the Fuego uh, is that all of this is built inside a container and runs inside a Docker container. Uh, the purpose of this is to avoid a lot of install issues. Um, so you should be able to run Fuego on any Linux distribution. Inside the Docker container, we're running a version of Debian. Uh, but uh, it's important to isolate ourselves from the host environment so that uh, when we're doing builds of test programs, we can make sure everything is 100% reproducible so that the test results uh, from one machine to another are, are uh, consistent. So uh, that is a really quick overview of uh, kind of the introduction to Fuego, the major components. Now I'm going to go into a little bit more detail and talk about the architecture. So uh, the architecture, uh, there, because of the two main components, uh, there's the Jenkins front end and the script back end, uh, most of the things uh, that we talk about when we talk about customizing Fuego uh, have kind of two pieces to them. They have a, a kind of a dual mode. The back end is mostly shell script based. Uh, there are some JSON files, and uh, in one case there's a, there's a Python file. But most of the actual uh, test infrastructure is built in shell scripts. Uh, and for example, the main interface between Jenkins and uh, the actual test programs that will be run on target is a single shell script. Uh, the reason we chose this is that shell is kind of the lowest common denominator language. Uh, we don't know what other language uh, developers might use uh, or be familiar with, but almost everyone who's working with Linux 
has at least some familiarity with uh, shell scripting, and we found that we could do what we needed. We basically are writing um, writing short uh, scripts to just launch commands on both the host and the target, and uh, shell seems to be a pretty good language for this type of stuff. Uh, there are also some other very small files besides shell scripts that are required for log parsing and result plotting, and I'll talk about those uh, kind of in more detail later. Um, if you look at uh, architecturally how this is all uh, deployed, uh, when you're doing uh, embedded Linux testing, uh, we've got it separated between the host machine and the actual target uh, or device under test. Um, on the host machine, we provide a container build system so that you can build your Docker container and, and get Fuego installed in there. Um, and then in that, inside that Docker container, we have Jenkins, the instance of Jenkins, which is running. The actual test programs themselves and the scripts control all this. Um, and that is accessible. Those, those will be uh, accessible with a web control interface. Notice that uh, kind of blue box there extends outside the yellow box. So you can uh, either access this locally using your web browser, uh, using a local host address, or uh, you can choose to publish this and make it available so other people can um, run tests on your machine and look at the results uh, externally. Now, the Docker container has um, a special relationship with the host. Uh, there are some things that we would like to be persistent even if the Docker container is not present. Um, and in particular, if we want to uh, change the version of Fuego or modify it, then there's some materials that we keep out actually in the host file system. And we use a volume mount for that, which is shown on the left of that yellow box. And uh, that's where we actually keep things like tool chains, uh, the configuration, which includes the board definitions, uh, all of your build materials, uh, so your builds are out there, as well as your logs. So you can look at uh, these materials uh, outside, just from the command line, you can go and look at this stuff, even if you uh, if you don't want to use Jenkins, um, or you want to save it for the next uh, version of Fuego that you're using. Um, so, Fuego is deployed as two different Git repositories, uh, uh, only one of which you need to uh, interact with in order to get it installed, and that's the Fuego repository. This is basically contains all of the stuff that's outside the container. So it has the container build system, and that includes uh, the Jenkins plugins, uh, pre-configured. Um, it has the default uh, configuration and some sample boards. Uh, as well as the host scripts for controlling the container and the documentation uh, for Fuego, the formal documentation. Now, in the process of building uh, Fuego, it will actually download into the container the Fuego core repository, which contains all the other stuff. That's the stuff inside the container. So this contains uh, the script and the overlay engine, uh, a bunch of all the prepackaged tests are inside that repository, and then there's a couple more things having to do with Jenkins extensions. Uh, and again, uh, the Fuego core repository, you shouldn't have to directly uh, clone that. It's a Git repository in Bitbucket. Uh, that is downloaded for you during uh, the process of building the uh, Docker container. So uh, to get it, uh, it really should be as simple as these four steps. Um, so you git clone the uh, fuego.git from Bitbucket, uh, tbird20d, that's my, my personal uh, repository. Um, you cd into the directory that's created and, and type install.shell. And uh, this will actually build the Docker container. That should run on just about any um, Linux distribution. Uh, but uh, if you have problems, definitely let us know. There. There's a troubleshooting guide. We j I just started last week a troubleshooting guide for uh, issues that people have encountered. Um, there are so anyway. So if you have trouble, there's a mailing list you can go to to ask for for help on this step. Um, but then uh, from the image that is created, uh, then you actually create a container, and then you start that container. And once the container is running, uh, Jenkins is already configured to run on port 8080 inside that container and use the uh, 
uh, URL prefix Fuego. So you can use Firefox in this example on the slides, but you can use any um, uh, browser that you want, Chrome or, uh, dare I say, Internet Explorer or something. Uh, well, I don't know, you won't be using localhost on that one, but uh, anyway, you can... But when you start the container, you actually are dropped at a shell prompt as root inside the container. Uh, you can get additional shell prompts, which is handy uh, when you go start editing files and manipulating some of the stuff uh, inside to create your own tests or to create board files. And so there's a couple of different mechanisms you can use to get additional shell prompts uh, inside the container that are listed there. Again, this is what the test framework looks like. Um, when you fire up that browser, this is... Uh, well, you're, you're, this is a populated screen that has some tests that have actually been run. Um, one test failed there in the list. And, and you can click on those tests to go look at uh, the status of them uh, to see instances and then drill down and look at the console log for a test and see what the problem might be. And then the other, uh, the actual tests themselves are listed under benchmarks and functional. And there are some other, other features in there. Um, Hopefully that's readable. It's kind of a small screen, but so um, I want to talk about, uh, in terms of architecture details, how a, a test is defined, uh, the different test phases, uh, and I'll talk about overlay generation and test parameter extraction. So in Fuego, a test really consists of um, uh, several different things. Uh, a the first is that there's actually a Jenkins uh, test definition. This is actually uh, in Jen Jenkins nomenclature. This is also referred to as a job. Uh, this defines the variables needed by Jenkins to actually execute the test. Um, there's a base script, which is a shell script that runs on the host, and that controls the execution of the test. Um, and this is uh, this is something that runs on host. The actual program. There's something that's going to run on test in, uh, on the target, and we call it, refer to that as the test program. Uh, and this is an executable or, executable or script that is run on the target. This is cross-compiled on the host, but then transferred over to the target and run there. Um, and then a Fuego test also uh, optionally can contain uh, a test variables, and this consists of uh, test specs and test plans uh, that provide a bunch of environment variables that uh, control how the test runs and what it results to expect from it. The results parser. And this tells the system how to interpret the results from the test log. Each test program uh, returns basically its own format. Uh, there's been, there's no kind of single canonical format that is used throughout the industry. And so it's, uh, it's important to be able to interpret and show the status uh, to be able to parse the different uh, formats of test logs. And uh, so that is provided as part of the test. Each test actually executes through several phases uh, during its execution because of this whole host target thing, and because uh, because we allow you, uh, we're shipping the test as source. There's a there's a pretest phase uh, where we prepare the target and check for dependencies. Uh, there's a build phase where we actually cross compile the test program using the SDK. Uh, we deploy it. Uh, which is transferring the test program and associated materials to the target. The run phase, where we execute the program on the target and log the results. Uh, there's uh, what we refer to as a processing phase to collect the logs and parse for results. And then a post-test phase, where we clean up the target and actually finalize the Jenkins job status. Uh, a phase, any of these phases can be empty if they're not needed. For example, there are some tests that are just executing a shell script on the target uh, in that case, there's no build, there's no need to compile anything on the host, cross-compile, or, de or deploy it even. Uh, well, you might be deploying a, the test script, but in some cases, there, there, you may not even need to deploy something to a target. You just need to execute something that's already there. So the test phases can be empty. Um, this is kind of a diagram that shows the sequence of events during a test. Uh, and uh, the different phases. So there's an expanded script that runs, and I'll talk a little bit more about how this expanded script gets created. But there's the pretest phase, uh, some logs, uh, there's a before log, system log that's created. We build, we take the tar file, we build the test program, we deploy it over to the, to the target, uh, we run it, that generates a log that we then pull back to the host. Uh, on the host, we, we analyze it, and then we do some, some post-processing on it. Uh, in our post-test phase. 
so the test execution, uh, we're kind of flowing between Jenkins and the abstraction scripts. Um, and so it, it's uh, it's not a, it's not all executed in one go. There's actually a couple different steps from the Jenkins perspective. So Jenkins initiates the test, which is a Jenkins test job, and that is either based on user input, you can manually start a test, or you set it up to be triggered by some condition, uh, and then that job will start the base script, and at that point. Uh, the base script uh, starts an overlay generator that creates an expanded script that builds up the environment for the test. Uh, and then that test script executes through most of the test phases. And uh, during the, this whole time, Jenkins is collecting the console log and uh, monitoring what's going on with the test. It also times the results, which is pretty nice, because then it gives you a, uh, a progress bar indicating about how far along you are in a particular test. Uh, Jenkins keeps track of, of all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then uh, the last uh, thing as part of a test is Jenkins executes the post-test step, and this is actually separate from the first script, but it actually uses the expanded script that was generated. So some more logs are collected, and then the Jenkins job status is update, updated, and then you can see the results in the Jenkins interface. Um, so just to give you an example of what a uh, test script looks like, this is uh, the file for uh, a hello world um, a hello world uh, program. It's a, a test program that prints hello world <laughs> and uh, and indicates whether or not it's successful or not by printing success after it's done. Um, and it's, there's kind of more to the story about you can test more than just hello world. But this is an example. So if you look at uh, this. This shell script provides several functions, test build, test deploy, test run, test processing. And those correspond to the phases that I mentioned earlier. So it, in the build phase, you're going to just do whatever sequence of steps are necessary to build the software. In this case, there's a hello.c program. Uh, I just, uh, before you get to the test build phase, um, Fuego will take the tarball, uh, it, it, um, untar it and put you into the directory where you need to be to perform this make. So make will, uh, this is a very simple program that does not require a configure step or anything, but this uh, just does performs the make and touches um, a file called test suite ready, which uh, basically lets the build system know that it worked. Uh, if that, if something goes wrong, then it outputs a build error. The next that will generate a file called hello. Uh, the, te the deploy function just puts hello onto the target in the Fuego home directory, and actually a test specific directory called tester. And test run uh, is actually going to uh, use the report command. Uh, basically, there's a CD, and then the actual invocation of hello is at the end here, dot slash hello, functional hello world arg. And that, uh, that environment variable is something that comes from the test specs and test plan. So you can use Hello World to test a couple of different things. Um, but uh, And then the final uh, function in here is test processing, which does a, uses the log compare function to look for one line that contains the word success and uh, determine that as a, uh, interpret that as a positive test result. Um, and I won't go into all the details of these different calls, but you can see that it's pretty easy. If you have an existing test program that you know how to cross-compile, it's easy to put this kind of wrapper together that will build it, put it out onto the target, execute it, and then check the log uh, for the, the final status. Um, so uh, the way that this hand happens, though, is a little bit more complicated under the hood. So each test has a simple base script, uh, like the one that I just showed. Um, but uh, what we do is we we have to generate a complete environment for that base script to use. Obviously, we're going to talk to a specific board. We're going to use a particular tool chain. And we may have other variables that are controlling the environment. And so we have uh, what we call an overlay generator as part of Fuego. And this is kind of like object-oriented programming for shell scripts. It allows you to um, have a base set of values uh, for functions and variables, but then override them 
uh, so you can take any of the any of the base um, Fuego functions and replace them uh, with your own versions, uh, depending on uh, the needs of your distribution or uh, kind of the quirks of your board. Um, there are kind of four areas of overlay functions and variables. Uh, there are functions that interact with the target, so those commands to get and put variables uh, or uh, log into the target. Those, these are in board definition files. There are tool chain variables, and then there are test parameters. Um, and basically, all of this provides a bunch of indirection for test program parameters. If you go back and look at that script that I had, you notice that there were several places where we were using environment variables. And this allows the test to be run on just about any hardware and in multiple different configurations. So this is what the overlay generating looks like. The base script, which has those four main functions, uh, test build, test deploy, test run, test processing. That actually starts, but then the Fuego functions are pulled into that, and then there's a, actually a Python generator. You should never have to look at the Python code. Uh, this is just a tool that takes uh, data from all these other sources in yellow there, the board configuration file, something called the tools.shell file, uh, and other places, and generates an expanded script, and that provides the complete environment for running a test. Um, so, what this allows us to do is uh, create abstraction mechanisms. And this abstraction, for basically for the test parameters, it means that the test can run in multiple configurations. So it can run it on different boards, different uh, distributions, different processors, different transport mechanisms. Those are all abstracted. Um, and different SDKs. Uh, Fuego also allows for test parameters uh, to be abstracted as well. Uh, so, for instance, when you're doing file system tests, uh, every board, uh, well, and even different board configurations, are going to have different places where the file systems are mounted, what file system devices are used, that type of thing. Uh, as well, uh, and you may uh, want to use the same test, but actually run it in different uh, configurations with different uh, program arguments in order to test different features of your board. Uh, so you may, for, for example, a file system test, you may have want to run the same tool, but use it to test uh, read-only file systems or read-write operations or random access operations. And so you can run the same tool with different test arguments. And then also, Fuego abstracts the expected results. So um, you can determine how what the, uh, what the result of the test is supposed to look like on a per-board basis. Uh, so the user can add their own new items to be abstracted through something called the test spec plan system. Uh, so to run a test manually, it's uh, very simple. You select a test, you select the target to run it on, you select the test plan, which is kind of the, uh, the, the particular thing that you want to test using, uh, using that test, and then you push run the test. And, um, this is, this is what the actual list of tests, this is the list of the benchmarks. Uh, if you can see in the, the, the tab for benchmarks is hidden, and is, is highlighted. Um, and you basically just click on the test there. Um, and that will take you to, well, I was on benchmarks and I went to a functional test, but anyway. This takes you to uh, the page for an individual test. In this case, a functional test. And then I don't know if you can see it there, but over there on the left, uh, there's a little button called Run Test Now, and you can use the Jenkins interface to configure attributes of the test. Um, and I'm not going to go into more detail here. It should be pretty straightforward as you walk through it. Um, when you get Fuego, uh, you really, uh, obviously it comes uh, kind of packaged to do some things, but you do have to do some customization in order to set up uh, your own board with it and to run your own test. So uh, there are kind of three things that you'll probably want to do in customizing it. Uh, you're going to want to configure the system to actually communicate with your board. Um, so you'll add a board configuration. Uh, you'll probably, there is an ARM tool chain provided, but you'll probably want to add your own SDK. Actually, I would highly recommend not using the default SDK, but use the SDK that, that is associated with your board. You should get one either with your board provider or have built it with uh, part of your internal distribution. Uh, and then, of course, you want to, uh, you will probably want to add your own tests. Uh, we have 50 tests there, but uh, there's 
there's uh, lots and lots uh, more things to test. And I'll talk more about that later. To add a board, it's pretty simple. You, add, you have to add two things. You add the actual board file, which, uh, and then you add add a new target in the Jenkins interface and refer to that board file. So uh, let me talk about that. So the board file it looks very much like a shell script. It's got a couple of little statements that are not shell script, but uh, you can ignore those. Um, and it's a shell script that basically has a bunch of variables that define, uh, describe the board. Uh, so the things that you described are things like the IP address, the SSH port, uh, the file system info, if you're going to do file system tests. A very key piece of information is uh, the platform, uh, and that indicates which SDK to use uh, for building the, the test programs. That is all put into a file uh, in the directory user data comp boards, uh, with the target name dot, dot board. There are examples in there already. In fact, uh, you're encouraged to copy those and just modify them rather than just kind of create one from scratch. Um, so this is what one looks like. Uh, this is the actually the sample file for running uh, Fuego on QMU ARM. Uh, so uh, in this case, it has an IP address of 172.17.01. Uh, kind of a non-standard SSH port, but you can see there's you don't have to define a, a, a whole lot. Of, um, the login directory, the Fuego home, that's where the test will actually be um, transferred to and executed from. Uh, another important one is the transport, which in this case is SSH, um, and then you define the architecture arm. That's a variable that's used with the tool chain. These other ones, starting from SATA dev down, are specifically for different types of tests. So in this particular this particular sample, uh, you can have um, you can do file system testing on a SATA device or a USB device or an MMC device. Um, and then there are some other variables that are specific to uh, individual tests. So uh, the LTP. Positive and negative counts for how many how many results you should see for those, and the same thing for expat. Um, and I'll I'll kind of come back to to that later. So once you've got created and out in the user data comp boards directory, uh, then you just need to add it actually into the Jenkins system. You do this by going to uh, the target status in the main screen. You select a uh, new node. And then you copy from an existing node in there called template dev, uh, and uh, you'll be presented with a dialog. You basically just have to uh, go to the environment variable in that configuration and set the board overlay uh, variable to the name of the board you just created. So it should be pretty straightforward to, uh, to set one up. So this is what the interface looks like for adding a board. Uh, and you can see, I don't know if you can see it, it's very small, but uh, under node properties, there's an environment variable board overlay, and it's got the, the value there in, in red is what you actually, that's where you put your, your file name for the board file. And you should your board should work after that. Um, the other thing that you want to do is you, uh, since we build from source, you'll want to uh, add your own tool chain. So as I said, there is a generic QEMU ARM tool chain that's pre-installed, uh, but you'll want to install your own. Um, and you can get it from wherever. You can obtain it or build it from your SDK. You need to install it. We, well, You can actually install it anywhere, but we highly recommend you install it. Well, it has to be inside the container so that the build system can see it. But uh, we've provided a default location, user data tool chains. Um, and this is something that once you install it in the if you put it there, it will show up outside the repository so that you can uh, fiddle with it on the host machine. Um, and then you have to uh, create a tools.shell file to reference it. Um, so here's an example. If you happen to be using the Yocto project, uh, here's an example uh, of the steps you would take to get a Yocto SDK uh, into your container. So you would do your bitbit command do populate SDK to actually create the SDK, and that will uh, that will churn for you know an hour or an hour and a half or however long it takes to for Yocto to build that huge SDK. 
then you do Docker PS and you figure out the container ID of your Docker container, and then you use a Docker copy command, cp command, to put that file that was just built, the SDK, into the container in the temp directory. Um, and then you have to go inside uh, the container. So in the shell that's inside the container, then you uh, actually run, execute that file, slash temp, slash pokey, you just like dot, 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 shell. Uh, poke, uh, Yahoo Project SDK has come as a single self-destructing archive. And then what you do is you specify the installation path for it under the directory user data slash tool chains inside the container. So in my case, I have a Pokey 2.01, and that's the path that I use. Um, so not a lot of steps. It's actually not that hard to get the container in there. Then the other thing you need to do is actually tell Fuego about the SDK. So you've got your, you've got your um, SDK in the, in the container. Uh, and you need to make sure that the boards and the system can use it. So you actually have to create a tools.shell file. So you determine a platform name, and this is completely arbitrary, made up by you. Uh, for the example on this page, I use the name foo. Uh, but you create a new file, uh, in this case, foo-tools.shell, and then uh, that file has uh, all of the variables that are needed to execute the the tool chain. So things like the prefix, the arch, uh, the CC, AS, LD, these are all kind of the standard environment variables uh, that are used when you're working with a tool chain in Linux. Uh, and in, and actually, uh, if you happen to be using the Octo project uh, tool chain, you don't have to set all those up manually, individually. Uh, Yocto project provides an environment setup script uh, when it installs the tool chain, and all you have to do is set the SDK root variable and source that environment setup script. So it's actually quite easy. I'm making it sound like it's kind of hard, but it's uh, it's actually pretty easy. Uh, and there are examples for you uh, for how uh, for existing uh, SDKs that you might use uh, for the one that's installed, QMU ARMS uh, V7HF. And then a logger tool is uh, an example of a uh, Yocto project SDK. That one is not pre-installed, but it's, uh, there is an example of what the tools file should look like. And then the last step is for any board that is going to use that tool chain, inside the board file, you just set the platform. So platform equals foo in this case. And that's the connection for all the tests that run on that board to use that cross-compiler. Um, so hopefully that's pretty pretty straightforward. Uh, the last thing uh, is we want to tell you how to add a test. Uh, uh, again, you, you may like all the tests that we have, but I'm sure you have your own tests that you want to run. Uh, and so a Fuego test, as I kind of said earlier, consists of that actual test program. That's the thing that runs on the target. And then again, this is shipped as source, or it can be a shell script or something that doesn't need compilation. Uh, you have the, the test shell script or base shell script. Uh, if you're running a benchmark, you have a couple other things. You have the uh, parser script and an evaluator expression. And then you finally have that Jenkins test declaration that you actually create inside the, the Jenkins interface. So a test can be either a functional test or a benchmark test. So let me talk about the difference between those two. So a functional test basically just is uh, something that returns success or failure, uh, pass or fail. This is most often used to detect regressions. Uh, you're trying to see if um, something broke, basically. You, you have modified something in either the software or the hardware, and you want to make sure that uh, something is still working properly. Um, so you can actually also run stress tests, which are a little bit different. They're they're intended to um, put pressure on the system to see if something will break. That's kind of the equivalent of the functional test, and you use the same technique for writing those as for functional tests, even if you're not interested really in the test itself. But uh, you do want to see on a stress test, the basic idea is you want to see if something falls over under pressure. Um, and then benchmarks are a little bit different because uh, you're going to get some kind of numeric result. Um, and for those, we actually provide integrated plotting. Uh, there's a parser that uh, you have to provide with a benchmark test that, that reads uh, a numeric value out of the test log. 
And then there's a specification that you provide uh, that includes the data name and the threshold to indicate pass fail. So a benchmark also has a uh, pass or fail condition, uh, but uh, because there are nu numeric results, we can also do kind of more data visualization and show you uh, the results over time. So you may see, uh, for instance, an increase or a drop in the performance of something uh, that may or may not cross the threshold, but you may still be interested in that in terms of data visualization. Uh, so the test program, uh, usually a pre-existing compiled test program. Uh, the source and patches are shipped in the Fuego 4 repository. This is cross-compiled by Fuego for each target. Now, some uh, people have actually asked about using test programs that are already included in the distribution. So it turns out that the Octo project has a bunch of test programs included by, uh, or you can include them uh, if you select those packages. And other distributions are the same. So there is a, a utility function is on target uh, that you can use um, to find uh, that binary on the target so that you, um, if you don't want to build it for some reason. Um, the test script uh, basically describes how to build the test program before the test target, execute it, and test for success or fail failure. It uh, can define the following functions. Uh, actually, with the exception of test pre-check, uh, all of those other four functions, test build, test deploy, test run, and test processing, uh, all need to exist. Uh, but they can be empty if you don't need to do anything. The, the best thing is just to return true, uh, make sure that the test continues to run. Um, and then at the bottom of your test script, you actually uh, source the uh, Fuego engine script. Uh, and then your script can call Fuego functions to perform the operations you need, like getting and putting or building or, or whatever it is you're doing. Um, so these are some of the functions that you would uh, that are available for you to call that are part of the Fuego API. Uh, you can do put and get to transfer files to and from the target. Uh, you can do a the command function to execute a command on target. The report function is the exact same thing as command, except the difference is that whatever happens uh, during that command is put into the log file, uh, so it's saved and used as part of the log for the test. Uh, the log compare function is 99% um, of the time this is used in the test processing function, and that goes out and checks the log for a pattern uh, to detect a pass or fail. And then there are utility functions. There's lots of them, but just a couple uh, that I'll comment on here. Uh, if you're doing uh, file system tests, uh, there are two functions, HD hard disk test mount prepare and a, uh, HD test clean unmount. And these are for mounting and unmounting file systems to kind of uh, prepare for and clean up after a file system test. Uh, for a file system test, you kind of want to start with a clean environment, and uh, so these are used in those types of tests. Uh, there are lots of functions available, uh, and uh, we're working on the documentation for them. Uh, if you go out to the wiki page, you can see uh, test script APIs uh, and see how to call them and, and what the parameters should be. Um, here's, uh, I showed you the example before for, uh, for the Hello World test. That one was a that one was very very simple, uh, but even for kind of a more complicated test, this is this is a sync test that is one of the file system tests. Uh, tests to verify that uh, file system is uh, syncing data correctly uh, when the sync syscall is, is used. Same types of steps. Uh, these sh nothing here should really be um, too. Two different. Uh, in the test build phase, you have the make and then test, test, test suite ready, otherwise an error. Uh, test deploy is just to put that binary that was created, it's called sync test, out onto the target. Uh, the test run uh, does some assert defines. This is checking to make sure that various uh, variables are defined from the target to make sure that we have a, a, the block device that we're going to use and the mount point and, and uh, and all of the arguments that we get from the test plan. And then you'll notice that the kind of the three main commands here, there's the HD test mount prepare, uh, the report, and if you look kind of deep embedded in the second line of that report command, you see uh, there's the actual call to sync test uh, with some arguments from the functional uh, sync test suite. 
And then the AQ test clean unmount, so that's the basically very few steps you can accomplish the test out on the target. And then uh, log the again the log compare, which is looking for a specific string in the in the uh, log that results. Um, so tests are pretty easy. It's pretty easy to write these wrappers on existing tests and uh, get them out. Now with benchmarks, that was a functional test. With benchmarks, there is a little bit of extra stuff. I'm not going to go into detail here because uh, I don't have time to cover everything. But um, but we have extra files that are involved for plotting the de benchmark data, something called parser.py, reference.log, and test.info. So to parse the test results, you write a little Python script. If you're not familiar with Python, don't be scared. Uh, you can copy one of the examples and really Really, the only thing you have to modify is kind of the regular expression that's used to search through the file. Um, but that extracts some data from the log and puts it into a Python map variable, uh, which then is used to compare it to the reference.log to determine uh, pass.fail. The reference.log basically just has the threshold uh, for determining pass-fail on the performance data or benchmark data. And, and then also uh, to provide for plotting, there's a, a file called test.info. You add some lines to that file uh, to plot uh, the variables uh, that came out of the log that you, you want to show to the user. So a couple of extras uh, to handle benchmarks. So this is what a plot looks like for a particular, this is dbench. I don't, I don't know why the uh, performance was all over the map on this thing, but uh, I was running this in a in kind of a weird environment. Um, so you can see what's happening with the performance of something uh, over time. Um, now, vision. I'm going to actually save that for the next presentation. So this this kind of uh, the uh, portion of my presentation that's a basic introduction to Fuego. Hopefully, uh, you can get a basic idea of how the system works, what some of the major components are, and uh, now I'm going to move on. Oh, some resources. If you want to uh, go out and experiment with this, uh, you can go out to the uh, the wiki for this project. is on bird.org Fuego and go to the front page for kind of the introduction. There's a quick start guide that will walk you through, uh, hopefully very quickly, some of the stuff I just covered in here uh, about um, uh, about getting set up, installing, the, you know, downloading the repositories, installing the container and, and starting everything. And if you have questions, uh, we have a mail list um, that you can subscribe to. So um, so let's move on to the status and future direction for uh, Fuego. So uh, this is a little bit higher level. Well, it's going to be a couple different levels. But let me, let me talk. I want to talk about vision first. And then I'll talk about recent activity that we've done in Fuego, some of the some of the stuff we've been working on, and then talk about the future, where we where we uh, are going from here. So the vision, my vision is I want to do for testing what open source has done for coding, um, and what I mean by that is if you look out at um, well, I think my next slide. Well, let me let me just talk about this for a second. If you look out at how we're doing testing uh, in the world today, uh, most people are testing stuff on their own. There's when we when we look at something like the kernel project, you have all these companies that are collaborating and they're sharing code. Well, we're not doing the same thing with testing, uh, and so let me let me talk about what I see as the problem. So a lot of our testing is ad hoc. Uh, it's very custom work that's done in house. There are lots and lots of manual steps. Uh, and part of this is just because we each have different products, but there's an awful lot of stuff that is just, I look at it and I just uh, feel really bad that people are doing the same steps over and over again. Now, there are open source test programs. So there are things like LTP and Bonnie and Cyclic Test, NetPerf, all those. Um, and we can collaborate on these as, as coding projects just the same way we would collaborate on any other piece of open source software. Uh, and there are also, there are test frameworks that are out there that are, that, uh, are parts of this whole puzzle. So there's Jenkins, Lava, Kernel CI, provide aspects of what you need to do testing. In fact, a lot of companies are using Jenkins. There's still companies using their own internal things for various reasons. 
But the problem is that there are still key pieces that are left to the user. Uh, and this includes what tests to run, uh, uh, how to run those test programs. Uh, y if you go online, if you take something like Cyclic Test, which is a real-time uh, performance test uh, program, there's a tutorial online that tells you what the arguments are and how you should configure it. But, there, but that's, that's geared towards manually telling you what to do, and then you end up doing it by hand. Uh, so there's nothing that tells you how to, there's nothing that helps you automate these tests. Um, and uh, the other thing is how to interpret the results. It's like, okay, great, I ran cyclic test or I ran LTP. Well, what, what results should I expect? It turns out that a program like LTP has thousands of tests in it, and it's kind of expected that you know, some percentage of them are going to fail. Uh, and so how do, you, how do I know which ones were supposed to fail or which ones are, I should care about if they fail? Uh, that type of thing, uh, we all have to develop ourselves in our independent companies, and we're not sharing that. And that's kind of the problem that I want to solve. So the solution, we want to reduce duplication of effort in testing. Uh, we want to allow developers and testers to share effort that each company is doing it by itself. And so the high-level strategy is we got to identify the manual steps, to, you know, and then start to capture them and figure out how we share them. So it's not like code. We're trying to capture, uh, in some cases, uh, test expertise. And, um, and so we have to figure out different, you know, we're at, at, at the end, we're going to be sharing, you know, data on a Git repository somewhere, but we have to figure out, well, what is the data that we're sharing? Uh, how do we capture that expertise? How do we move it around, and how do we uh, put it in a format that is usable in multiple contexts? Uh, another really key part of this is that the test framework has to gain popularity in order to create this community effect that we want. So uh, it can't be a really terrible test framework. It's got to have at least uh, some good features so people can adopt it, otherwise you won't get that collaborative effect. Uh, and so uh, we also want to focus on real tests and test results. Um, the, it's, well, that kind of stands to reason. If, if you're going to convince people to use something, it's actually got to be useful. It's got to do something that benefits them. Uh, it's got to benefit both the users of it and the, and the community. So some of the features that I believe are really required here you got to have quick and easy setup. Uh, you have to support a wide variety of configurations and build systems. Uh, again, you have to kind of generalize it to make it useful for everybody. So we have support now in Fuego for Yocto project, aspects of Yocto project. We want to extend that to build root. We want to support a wide variety of targets. Uh, we currently ship with just a few examples, but we want to uh, make it possible to to access lots and lots of boards. I'm not sure we're going to ship, uh, you know, like a board file for every board in the universe, uh, but we at least want to make it possible to get one. Um, and then support a wide variety of connection types. Boards are all different. Some can only be accessed versus by serial port, serial console. Right now, Fuego is uh, completely focused on SSH, uh, but there are also, there's a whole community, Android community, that's using ADB as their kind of uh, target control mechanism. Uh, so we want to support a wide variety of connection, connection types. And then, uh, very important to make it easy to create and publish new tests uh, and and kind of capture that expertise I was talking about. Uh, again, we need to share test experience and collateral. And this is not just the test programs themselves. We need to be able to share test results. Uh, we need to share the parsing methods. We need to share the test parameters. Uh, to capture that expertise. I have in my vision this idea of a test app store. Uh, you know, everyone's familiar on their mobile phone now that you can just click on a button and go find, you know, go scan through hundreds of thousands of applications and download one that suits your needs and, and download, you know, 10 or 20 or, and easily, you know, scan the ones you want. I would really like in the future there should be the same type of thing. There should be thousands of tests to, to choose from. Um, and we want results being aggregated from tens of thousands of test nodes. Uh, if we can make this popular, 
uh, we really want to be able to crowdsource the results, kind of like Wikipedia, right? So no, uh, an individual contributor of Wikipedia uh, is just doing a little tiny thing uh, and edit on one page or a couple of pages, but uh, the aggregate result is something that is valuable for the entire, well, in the case of Wikipedia, for the entire world, humanity. Uh, if we could make something that was valuable for the entire industry uh, of embedded Linux users, uh, that would be really valuable. So that's the vision. Some of the things that we need to do is we have to have increased automation. One thing that is really difficult, um, the reason that there's so much manual stuff done in testing today is because uh, you have to, the test environment consists of more than just the Linux distribution and the local hardware. You need heterogeneous multi-node testing. What do I mean by that? Uh, lots of tests need other endpoints or external hardware to communicate with. So if you're going to test USB, you can't you can't test that in isolation. You have to have some device connected on USB. Um, and you and to test USB effectively, you need multiple devices. And uh, same thing with all kind any almost anything that has a bus or uh, some external connection, I2C, you can have Wi-Fi CAN bus. Uh, audio and video stuff, all kinds of inputs and outputs, you can't just focus in on the test, the device under test, you actually have to control a broader environment. And these are these are very hard tests to automate because of this. Uh, if you're going to test like USB charging, you need to be able to control uh, the voltage on the USB charger, to switch between different charger types, uh, connect and disconnect the charger, put, put test loads on it, uh, all of that can require specialized hardware configuration. Same thing with CAN bus. If you want to test CAN bus, you probably need a, a packet injector uh, or you need control hardware. That's all separate from the device under test. And so it turns out that setting this stuff up is pretty difficult. Uh, what we want to do is make it possible to share these setups so that if, if four or five people around the world set up something, uh, then a developer can leverage that ship the tests over there so we can match up the tests that need, be, need to be performed and these kind of rare setups uh, that have the automation to, to do it. Uh, the other thing, of course, is we want increased hardware coverage. Uh, one of the biggest problems in the Linux kernel community, uh, and one, the Linux Foundation was actually, uh, before it was the Linux Foundation was the uh, open source test lab or something like that, uh, was actually created to address this problem in the enterprise space is that a Linux kernel, kernel community doesn't have all the different hardware to test on. Uh, and so when they get a patch, there's just thousands of different uh, pieces of hardware that might be affected, and uh, they need to test. But uh, um, if you look uh, at what I consider to be the most successful board level project, uh, kernel CI, that has about 10 labs, about 160 boards, and has uh, so far done about 2 million different boot tests. And that is an excellent start. Um, uh, but I think we want to scale way beyond that. Uh, there's much more than a, a... That 160 board is not 160 different board types. That's probably on the order of about uh, 50 or 60 board types. Um, and, you know, there are much more many more products and boards out there uh, in the world than that. And so we need to scale up. I want to do the same thing, uh, but not necessarily using board farms uh, and not necessarily using kernel testing. Uh, I want to make it possible for any individual Linux developer to create a, a test node in this, uh, this big community of test nodes. Um, and so what I want is I want 10,000 test nodes. That's kind of my goal. I want the ability to run tests at the request of the community. Uh, so this means the ability to customize a test to find individual bugs. So for example, if a user reports a bug to a kernel developer and he says, well, it's on hardware XYZ, uh, then the kernel maintainer, who's, oh, let's say it's uh, uh, a networking bug, uh, the kernel maintainer can actually run a test on you know, node 2374 that happens to have that particular hardware and can reproduce the bug can, and gather the, the logs and the uh, to see that. 
And you can only do that once you've got a big network of, of nodes and you have things uh, configured for this. This requires granting access to third parties uh, to your test hardware. So that's not going to work for certain situations. So most companies are not going to expose their uh, prototype product hardware uh, to, to the kernel community. But for dev boards and for lots of things, um, for products that have already been released, uh, to, to check for regressions, this is the type of thing that uh, would be beneficial. Uh, and this also requires a trust network. So um, you have to be able to trust that the code you're going to run on your own board in your lab is not going to uh, destroy the board or mess up uh, your test environment. And I would argue that you need the same mechanisms as the kernel. You need a traceable affidavit about uh, who created this test, um, and you need to be signed and validated, that type of thing. So there are some real significant issues that have to be addressed in order to fulfill this vision. So that's the vision. Uh, 10,000 node network uh, testing away on the kernel with, uh, with thousands of nodes, uh, thousands of tests in an app store that a developer can easily use. So uh, let me talk about recent activity, uh, how we're taking baby steps to get there. Um, so recently uh, in Fuego, uh, I've been doing um, I've been doing uh, these activities. I did a survey of test tools. I've been collecting test stories, um, and uh, I, I want to talk about some of the actual coding work that's been going on in Fuego, and then I'll go through some branding and infrastructure that's been in the last year. So let me start with the survey of test tools. So. One of the things I wanted to do was go out and see, well, what is already out there? And there's more, way more out there than I have looked at, but I have looked at Lava, Kernel CI, and K-Self test in the last year, uh, in particular recently, <clears throat> to see what they already had to offer. So let me talk about each of those. So Lava is Lenaro's test framework. It is a very powerful test scheduler uh, that understands how to interact with many boards and bootloaders. Um, it has a scalable, secure architecture, uh, very scalable architecture. It has, some, it's got some really good ideas about security. Uh, it's currently on its second generation. Uh, they're in the process of rolling out the second generation. It does not include a lot of tests itself. Actually, I don't think it, I could be wrong, but I don't think it includes any tests. Um, it is the framework to that you put your tests into, and it's pretty darn complex. <laughs> People who have tried to set it up. Uh, it, it is, especially the 1.0 version. They've made some uh, usability enhancements for 2.0, but it's uh, pretty complicated to set up. It's kind of got a weird way of laying out uh, some of its, um, some of where they keep their variables and their formats and stuff. Um, but it, this is, uh, but it is a, it is a, a, a good framework, and it's used by, uh, it's used by several different projects. In particular, it's used by AGL JTA, which is um, JTA is the Fuego precursor uh, that's being used by the Linux Foundation Automotive Group, and they're using it for board management. So they've actually put what is essentially Fuego on top of Lava uh, to manage their uh, continuous integration testing for AGL. Uh, kernel CI. This is a project that by Lenaro, uh, specifically designed to find kernel boot regression. So I talked about this before. Uh, they have been testing many, many upstream source trees on all these boards, and they have found a lot of actual bugs. Uh, they have a nice centralized management of their entire test system, so you can go to a single site and look and see if uh, your board has stopped working because of patches upstream. Um, it has good support for board farms. It's kind of centered around, it's kind of board farm centric, uh, and that's how it if they actually recommend that if you want to get a new board into the lab, instead of setting up your own lab, send it to one of the existing ones um, where they have this kind of expertise. Again, kind of the rare setup I was talking about before. Uh, but they have really good results aggregation and comparison, uh, actual track record of bug fixes. And interestingly, they're only focused right now on boot testing. And uh, I think because this really kind of started as an ARM initiative, one of the significant problems in the ARM space is that they're not running upstream kernels. Uh, almost no one is running an upstream kernel on products, uh, but this is even true for 
uh, some dev boards. Well, th- these guys are helping add out a lot by uh, by making sure that board that what goes into the upstream kernel is not breaking any of the boards that do support upstream. Uh, you can run the latest kernel on. So this is a, actually a very successful and good project. Uh, then there's KSelf test, which is the kernel unit test framework. So this is the kernel developers themselves putting together tests for their individual subsystems. Uh, and this is a great thing. It's relatively new um, uh, as of kernel 4.1. So depending on what you're actually running on your products today, you may not have seen this yet. Uh, but it has no automation. This is all manual. Uh, there's no output consistency. Each each test has its own output format and requires a human to interpret it. Uh, so if you're not kind of the maintainer in that area, you know, it's kind of hard to know what to make of the results. Uh, it's like, okay, so, you know, I, I ran, say, the, um, I don't know, there was a check, uh, a breakpoint test. It's like I have no idea what the results are supposed to look like for that. Uh, the other issue is that it has no notion of multi-node testing. So there are lots of, like I said, test systems in the kernel that require a test environment that is bigger than a single node. Um, and uh, as far as I know, it, it doesn't have, have any support for that. Um, so some of my conclusions from looking at these different test test tools is that the test frameworks are all focusing on different parts of the overall test picture. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, none of these seem to be focused on abstracting the test invocation and analysis parts, uh, the actual starting the test and the, the test parameters and then analyzing the results. And that seems to be where Fuego fits as um, kind of its its um, specialty. Um, and so uh, we really need to figure out how to collaborate on common pieces. There are some there are some areas where we're overlapping. Fuego has uh, Fuego and Lava in particular overlap on uh, they talk to boards, they know how to communicate with boards and reboot them and uh, detect certain things. And so I think it's really important that we start working together to make some standards so that all these different tools, the different labs and tests can benefit from improvements that we're making. That's kind of the first level of collaboration. The next thing I did uh, recently was I went out and I collected some test stories uh, at Lenaro Connect in the LC Europe. I tried to talk to different people. Uh, I may try to collect some more at future events. Uh, my intent was to post these on the wiki, uh, to look for some uh, look for some commonalities uh, to kind of inform us of what the priorities ought to be. The results are uh, all over the map. Everyone wants to test something different. Uh, and uh, if we're going to collaborate, we kind of have to find those commonalities uh, to work on. There's lots of manual activities. Everybody I talked to had just a ton of manual activities. And it's pretty hard to convert from manual automate, automated. Uh, every bird, every bore, kind of ports, the configurations that people create for their setups are kind of different. Um, and again, you, there's a lot of need to control external entities during a test. Again, this heterogeneous multi-node testing. Uh, the thing that's shocking is there's absolutely no sharing going on. Everybody is doing this manually, all by themselves. They're doing it from the ground up. There's no sharing of, of text expertise at all. And so the real issue here is, uh, how do we share that? So what are we doing in Fuego? Uh, well, the, you, yeah, I'll leave it to you to try to figure out the connection between some of these. But here's some things that have been going on recently. This is, this is now down to just a very nuts and bolts um, uh, features that we've added recently. And this is, this is a list of just four features I'm highlighting. So there's now a new phase, uh, test pre-check. Uh, this is a base script function you can add uh, to support pre-testing the target and the environment. So we actually already have something in Fuego called assert define, which is a helper routine to check that uh, a, an argu- uh, one of the environment variables in the test is set. Um, and we're going to start moving those uh, into this pre-check function. So basically, the, the purpose of this phase or this step in the test will be to determine that uh, the test actually even is capable of being run and the configuration is proper. Some of the things we're going to, we already, I've added one helper routine is on target, and that's to detect binaries on the target uh, and help avoid building the test program if it's already in the distribution. 
Uh, we'll probably we'll probably create some helper routines for other things uh, like checking the kernel config, uh, ch validating that there's hardware present uh, that's needed for certain tests. Um, the, the whole idea is to abort the test early if the target environment is missing a key feature. And we may, uh, in Jenkins, distinguish, give it a different type of error so you can see that it failed in the pre, the test failed in the pre-check phase as opposed to actually the test itself. Uh, I'm still uh, thinking about that. That's something that's worth discussing on the mailing list. Uh, a lot of work has gone into uh, the FTC tool. FTC stands for Fuego Target Control uh, or Fuego Test Control. I'm not sure yet, but anyway. Yeah, this is the uh, this tool is a command line tool. It has the ability to add and update test variables in the board file. Um, now you might think, well, it's pretty easy to manually add stuff to the file, right? You just open up VI and you type some type some stuff. But of course, the whole idea here is we're trying to automate more things, and so uh, the FCC tool gives you something that you can actually call from a test program or from some other like an installation program. Uh, that can store variables uh, that will be persistent that go along with the board. So you want to store persistent information. Uh, for, for now, the purpose really is primarily to support target probing and the saving of found information. So I want to be able to use the FTC tool to do things like uh, probe, the, har probe uh, the target, determine if it's got a configuration, and auto-populate some of the stuff in the board file. So the installation of boards is much easier, um, and it, that's one of the features of it. The other, some of the other features, it's got the ability to actually launch a test from the command line. Uh, you can query the targets in the tests, get some information on those. Uh, so it's a pretty handy tool as it is. It's it's kind of uh, alpha grade right now. It needs some more work, uh, but it's coming along. Uh, Oh, the other thing, just going back, the other thing about the FTC tool, a request that I got was people said, well, I want to use Fuego, I want to use all the extraction scripts and the, and the test, but I may not want to use Jenkins. So for those people, if you can put your front end on top of this command line tool, you can use something else besides Jenkins if you want. Uh, now it's going to end up placing logs and doing builds in kind of the places that Jenkins expects them, but uh, we may be able to figure out... We kind of need to wait to see who the first non-Jenkins Fuego front end is and figure out uh, where we want to generalize things for that. Uh, there's been a lot of work on the documentation. Uh, we're about 50% done. Uh, we have all the main functions documented, but there's a bunch of internal ones that still need some work. There's templates for writing new API documentation. Uh, and on the wiki, we've put a bunch of docs about some of the Fuego details, the phases, the different logs that are generated. There's kind of a dizzying amount of log stuff going on. Uh, there's a lot of environment variables that are being passed around, some generated by uh, Jenkins, some generated by Fuego, and just kind of explaining what those are and what the, what the values should look like so you can interpret the log better. Um, so we're moving along on that front. Uh, and then proxy support, uh, Daniel, I don't know if Daniel's here today, uh, but uh, he uh, just sent some patches, sent a whole bunch of patches actually, but one uh, that I wanted to point out was this proxy support uh, allowed for installation inside a corporate firewall. Uh, I got to some of your other patches, I'm done, uh, but I did not finish processing this one, uh, so sorry Daniel, but uh, anyway, um, that's, that actually I think is a, a very nice feature that we'll have in the future. Uh, some of the things we've done, uh, other things that kind of non-coding things. We did some branding. We did the name change. It used to be called JTA. That was actually done way back in March. Uh, the official logo, I'm just making this stuff up as I go along, but uh, I'm going to say that the official logo is the word Fuego in aerial, red, bold, slightly rotated. And then I have this flame thing. I can give anybody who wants that, uh, that little vertical flame thing. And then uh, I think I've determined, based on uh, stuff I did at ELC, that I want the official candy of Fuego to be hot tamales, uh, just because they have flames on the cover and they're spicy cinnamon. And uh, anyway, so we, you know, every every project should have an official candy. Um, so if you're wondering about the branding, what Fuego means, uh, Fuego refers to a place on Earth. Uh, the southern southernmost part of the South America, 
uh, Tierra del Fuego, where penguins live. So there's kind of a penguin Linux tie-in. Fuego is fire in Spanish. It's the Spanish word for fire. And fire is often associated with trials and purifying, so there's kind of a hook into test, testing things. Uh, and it kind of sounds neat, and uh, I think it's pronounceable by most people. Um, the only downside that Fuego is a real word, and so you can't Google it as easy as JTA, but uh, I think if you have Fuego test or something, you can still find, find the stuff. And you can do stuff like this. This is funny, kind of fun. Fuego, it's hot. Go, go study it. Okay. The other thing uh, recently is infrastructure. Uh, so we've been building up the website. Uh, the, there's a, it, I call it a website. It's really just a wiki. Uh, it's on bird.org for now. And, and I, I'm not married to that. It just was handy for me because that's where I had uh, access to put a bunch of stuff. Um, and then there, we have a mail list that was created, I think, in August or September time frame. Uh, I also actually have a virtual private server. Uh, I'm, my intent is to put some online demos. I want to put the Fuego interface online so that during talks like this, I can tell people, oh, go out and try it and see what happens. And uh, so they can look at the interface and see how it works and get accustomed to it. Uh, that is not populated yet. I actually have, I have Jenkin, I have Fuego installed out there and running, but I, I wanted to set it up with a, a QEMU um, target so people could have a target to play with. Um, anyway, it's uh, there's some QEMU issues on the VPS. I haven't had time to finish that one, but that's the goal there. So putting together some infrastructure for the project. So future directions. What do we want to work on going forward? Uh, this is kind of my ideas. Obviously, anybody who has contributions to make, I am... I. Uh, I will try to be better about responding to patches quicker. This last couple of weeks has been kind of uh, hard. Uh, been pretty busy, but uh, uh, here's what I want to do. I want to make uh, easier installation and setup maintenance. Uh, I want to do something called a target dictionary. I want to come up. Well, I'll go through each of these: test packages, test user interface standards, and so uh, easier installation. I really want to provide some tools to assist installation. Uh, it's actually pretty easy if you know what you're doing. Uh, to get Fuego up and running, but I want to make it even easier. Uh, I want to provide a sample board that you don't have, so you don't have to create your own board file. I want to create a sample board that you can actually, just with the command line tool, give it two or three command line uh, invocations, and and you're done. You don't have to create the Jenkins node. You don't have to edit, edit any files by hand. Uh, so that's one thing. Another thing is I would like to provide a pre-built container on Docker Hub uh, so that most people don't even have to do the installation phase. They can, uh, they can actually just download the Docker container. Uh, the other thing is I want to write a health check test uh, so to go out and verify that the board and is all set up correctly. This is kind of part of installation, uh, assisting installation. So once you once you've uh, Install the board, just go out and check that it's healthy. And I think you can run this on a periodic basis just to make sure that things like your connection are still working and uh, it's kind of a sanity check. I mean, you can't use an existing other test for this, but uh, but I want something that's uh, kind of specifically tests certain attributes of the board connection and stuff like that. Uh, the target dictionary, this is an idea that I kind of got from the Lava guys. And this is a defined place to put per board test parameters and collateral. So I've kind of started this with the FTC tool that you can add variables from the command line into that, and so and thus also you could add variables from the uh, from a test. So you can have a test go find something out about a target and then go put it in the board file for now. Um, and this ties into the whole idea of uh, having the test collateral stored somewhere persistently and, the, and being allowed to share it. Uh, also, I want to reorganize the test specs and test plans. They're kind of clunky, I think. Uh, they're in JSON right now, and I don't see any good reason why uh, why we even need a default test plan. The default test, uh, if you're sorry, this is this is for those who are familiar with Fuego. Uh, it's anyway that that can be improved a little bit there. Uh, and then I want to make a test packaging framework. So I want to make the test separate from the framework. Uh, so we need to define very specifically what needs to be shared. 
there, we have a really good idea of what's in a test, but it's spread all over the place. Um, there's the test script and the source. Uh, the Jenkins config is over in one part of the repository. The test specs and the test plans are over in some other part. I want to be able to collect those up and very easily uh, publish those externally uh, along with results for particular boards. Uh, I want to write essentially a test plugin architecture. So the same way that um, Jenkins allows you to have plugins, I want someone to be able to um, Easily manage tests. Go, you know, basically it's the it's the application like the the Play Store. Uh, you go out, and look in the store, download a new test, in, install it individually, create a package from existing materials, publish a test really easily. And we may not put this definitely into a package, but we, we could do the same thing with maybe Git repositories. So if that's where you want to store your test, but I think there's definitely some value in, in defining how we package tests and uh, doing that going forward. Um, and then test interface standards. I, I want to work with the lab and the kernel CI guys in particular uh, on uh, how uh, supporting multiple front ends and back ends in Fuego. Uh, well, Fuego, the abstraction script is arguably the kind of the core component, but I do want to support multiple front ends. I talked about that already. Um, I want to possibly come up with recommendations for hardware and firmware. Things like, oh, it's really good if you expose a serial console. There's certain things you can do, and and uh, you know every firmware should support TFTP boot for easier testing. Those types of things. I don't think there's a document anywhere that kind of describes these things in a way that's uh, clear to hardware developers how valuable this is for for the industry. Uh, and then come up with some. Uh, com if we're going to define some standards, we want to come up with some tests related to those standards, so some science tests and some ratings for systems that support that. Uh, so that, for instance, you know, some the beagle bone, you know, gray or whatever the next one's going to be, purple. Uh, and you can say, oh, well, you know, it's test compliant at a level of, you know, 7.5. It has these features that make it easy to run Fuego or Lava or Kernel CI or K self tests on it. Um, and uh, then people can understand, oh, okay, well, uh, if I want a higher grade, I can add these features to my board or to my firmware. Um, Let's see, some other, some other stuff. So we want to do, I want to do some actual self-tests for the test framework. Uh, it's kind of ironic, uh, <laughs> but I, we're starting to get into the, uh, into the thing where we're releasing the test, uh, the test framework, and we need to make sure it works. Uh, so uh, some self-tests are in order. Um, and then uh, matrix of tests versus board results, that uh, has to do with how we're sharing stuff there. Uh, obviously, add some more tests. I want to refine, specifically refine the board bring up tests. There are some tests in there now for Minasoft, but they're very specific to the logger board. Uh, I'd like to add K self test as a whole kind of suite of tests in the in the um, tool, and look at long term about actually doing a kernel boot test as well, doing kernel CI type stuff. Uh, for that one, I'm kind of waiting on the serial console support. Uh, the kernel CI guys have convinced me that uh, you have to do this type of testing with the serial port. You you cannot. Uh, the very first thing to break, they say, is the network. So you can't do this with SSH. It's got to be done with the serial port. Um, I'd like to move the official docs to ASCII doc or some other markdown. Markdown. The the current late text support is just obnoxious. Uh, if there's someone from from Cogent in the room, I apologize. Uh, I'd like to declutter the Jenkins interface. It's got a ton of stuff in the front end that really doesn't have anything to do with uh, what we need, uh, so Maven testing and AMP testing and all this stuff. It'd be nice to kind of remove that so it's easier. Improve, continue improving documentation, handle USB connections, and I have some uh, important news. Uh, we want to support boards with uh, only a serial console. and. In Berlin, at our meeting in the Core Embedded Linux project, we actually have a, now a contractor for this work, Linea Solutions. We'll be doing the work on this and uh, we'll be um, working with them on that. That should be coming out in a month or two. Well, we'll see uh, how long it takes. But uh, don't have time to work on that myself, but I think it'll be a really valuable addition to add another transport mechanism. Uh, so just to be clear, I am going to talk a little bit about what Fuego is not. Um, I'm not really gearing Fuego up to be a board farm tool. 
my my goal of scaling this out is not to make everyone in the world capable of running 20 boards uh, off of a single host or in dealing with all of the hardware nightmares and that type of stuff. My, my idea is that the way we scale this out is we make it easy for an individual developer with a single node to, to test on that node and, and then we do that a thousand times. Um, so we can support multiple nodes, but that's not the focus. Um, handling that extra scalability of board farms is difficult and it requires extra hardware. And so I'm focused on a single developer testing a single board. Um, not to say if someone's doing that, I will, you know, will help them, but that's not our focus. Uh, the other thing is right now, uh, we have so much other stuff on our plate, I don't want to get into the results aggregator stuff yet. I think uh, Kernel CI is doing a good job of that. We may look at what they're doing, uh, but I actually want to scale out the tests first. I want to make it useful to the individual developer to actually run a bunch of tests, um, and we'll worry about kind of the aspect of globalizing and sharing uh, the results uh, later. So some of the other so stuff that's related to that that I'm deferring is I'm not sending data to a centralized repository. I'm not saying we'll never do it. I'm just saying that it's not a focus right now. Um, and that's it. So uh, unbelievably, I have finished on time, and uh, I would be happy. I would be happy to take any questions that you have. Yeah. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Jenkins update because the AGL guys uh, are using, I think they're on to like a 2.0. Has, has Jenkins got the 2.0? I think it has. Anyway, they're using a very, very modern Jenkins. And um, so I, that's one of the things. I don't want them to get too far away from what we're doing in Fuego. And so I started looking at it. Um, I think the current plugins that we're using are probably going to work okay. I actually. Uh, I don't think it'll be too hard. What the AGL people discovered was uh, there was uh, one or two things that broke. They decided that they were going to abandon uh, some of the user interface changes that Fuego made to Jenkins. At what version are we on? Like 1.5 something? Uh, so they abandoned the user interface change. Some of the, uh, they were kind of, kind of cosmetic user interface changes. And then they also, uh, they kind of uh, broke the plotting uh, but they just didn't care. So I I don't think we have, uh, apparently we have the source for the little plotter plugin module, uh, but that, that might be something that is problematical. But in terms of kind of the core of the system, I don't think it'll be too hard. I think most of the plugins in Jenkins, especially just going from a 1.5 to a 1.6 type of environment, I think those will probably work okay. The, the Jenkins plugins, the external ones we're using seem to be pretty stable. Uh, it's the internal 
the, the one plotting one is kind of an internal one that Kojit wrote, and uh, that one broke. And I don't, I don't know if it's really hard to fix or not, but it required kind of more Jenkins knowledge than I had uh, to go look at it. Um, but th I would suspect the core of the system's not too bad. So. I think uh, Jenkins, uh, Jenkins uh, is upgraded. Uh, it is much more easy to collaborate with uh, to a new uh, virtual machine or Docker container uh, outside of Jenkins. So, uh, so I will try uh, uh, following your uh, suggestion or AGA JPA's uh, output. Yeah. So yeah, please, please communicate on the list. I'm I'm very interested in this topic. Like I said, I started some stuff. Uh, what I wanted to do was actually convert to a system. So right now, we have the the plugins are uh, kind of we have a snapshot that has them kind of pre-installed, and we just take that directory and we put it into the container. Uh, what I'd like to do is convert to a system where we have a script that uses the Jenkins uh, command line interface mm -hmm. to actually install the plugins. And that would make us uh, much much less dependent on a particular Jenkins version. Uh, but but you, uh, whatever you do, I will be very, very happy to, to see your results. Um, and so, uh, but yeah, I'd like to be able to discuss that with you. So as you, as you work through it, I'm very interested to follow uh, what you do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, Dan. Hi, Dan. Sorry, I gave you too much work. No, 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 it's all good. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get to it as soon as this uh, mini conference is over. <laughs> So my question is about uh, your new FPC tool. Uh, I have uh, some, some uh, question about the test variables for, for the board. I think there are many two mechanisms now by which you can put the variables. One is to put them on the, on the board file. And the second one is to use uh, a different test plan. So I think it's much more clean to have the, the test variables separated from the board files because then you can test the same board with different uh, parameters for the test. So I wanted to know what you think about that. Well, I, I agree. I, well, there's some, yeah, in fact, I don't know if you kind of noticed I, when I got to the data dictionary thing I kind of uh, kind of fuzzed over where I want that to reside ultimately right now my FTC tool puts them puts the test variables into the board file but I agree with you that there are some things that uh, that don't make sense for that um, my my first use case for the for doing that was uh, for this uh, uh, pro uh, target probing, and so it kind of made sense to put the result of that into the board file. But if you're if you want to do have command line control over other test parameters, I agree with you that it would be good to put them other places. I haven't really haven't really figured out um, how to categorize the variables or how to kind of determine where to put them, other other than just by following where they are uh, already. So or you know by using the name. Obviously, if you if you are setting the variable, you know, functional hello world uh, argument, then uh, you should put that in a test spec or test plan or somewhere like that. Um, but but maybe not. I don't. You know, it, it's. Uh, I'm still I'm still thinking through exactly how I want the data dictionary to to uh, to work. So this is probably a good discussion for us to have on the mailing list. I found the interface to be very convenient for running tests manually. 
But it's a little bit hard to understand which tests are going to be run on each board. So I, I would rather have a, an interface where you click on a board and then you can select the tests that you want to run for that board. For example, every, every day or manually. Instead of having to do it each time manually. Okay. Oh, I think that sounds good. Yeah, I think uh, um, one of the things I haven't really delved into is we have these uh, run all tests that Cogent put together. They don't, they're, uh, I haven't used them at all because um, they, um, well, they, because they fail as soon as one test fails. There, and I have, uh, there may be an option, a simple option to say, well, continue even on failure. Uh, but right now, since they fail after the first failure, they're, they're kind of useless. Um, but uh, I do really good to be able to, you know, set up a profile for what you want to do on a particular board. Um, so I think that's a good suggestion. I have to look at Jenkins and see uh, how we might do something like that. Regarding to that, uh, I was thinking that many of the tests actually contain multiple tests, right? And right. Even, even though, for example, 90% of the tests pass, in the end, if only one test uh, fails, uh, from the Jenkins interface point of view, there's going to be a red block saying that the test didn't pass. And right. I, I find this very inconvenient. Uh, I would rather have a list of the tests that pass, a list of the, the tests that didn't pass, and maybe some error logs on the search. Uh, I will present some work that I've <coughs> been doing for ATP about that, but maybe we need to generalize something about that. Yeah, actually that's related to something else uh, that I didn't mention in my presentation, which is that we, don't, we actually don't expose the test logs themselves through the Jenkins interface. Um, and we really should be. I mean, you ought to be able to click on something and see the test log. Uh, and possibly there's another format of the log called the parsed test log, which is just, it boiled down to just the success and failures. Um, I don't know if that would address, I think it would address part of what you're saying, but not all of it. Um, but I do agree that having a single red dot, Jenkins has other, I still haven't figured out. Maybe someone can tell me what's the difference between unstable and failed. Uh, I'm meaning to look that up. Uh, I don't know if there's such a thing in Jenkins as like a partial failure. Yes. Um, I, I think okay. it's, it's great. It means that you didn't test it or something like that. Okay. So for example, in, in, the, in the function that you added the test to check, if it fails uh, when taking the dependencies, we, we should use some some symbol to say that. Right, right. If it fails, right. it just didn't, it didn't run because the uh, dependency is just failed. Like right, yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what I'd want to do with something like that. But I haven't got into the details of that at all. So, yeah, if you have some stuff there, I'm very happy to look at it. Uh, so. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> I just found out the wireless microphone here so that uh, maybe next time we will be able to make more, you know, better, you know, set up. Anyway. Okay. <laughs> Is there any question here? Anyway. So, thank you very much, Tim, and have a nice, good evening today. Well, so, uh, yes, thank you very much. Yep. Yeah. <laughs>